Hi, Else here, and today we're talking about the Statement of Income, Comprehensive Income, under IFRS. I have already produced a series of videos where I introduce students to all the financial statements using IFRS, but at the introductory accounting level. If you have not watched those videos, I highly recommend you do so. So, back to the Statement of Income, Comprehensive Income for Intermediate Accounting. First, it's important to understand that IFRS allows a lot of freedom with regards to the format of financial statements. Why? Because the objective of financial reporting is to provide financial information which is useful for decision making, generally decisions that investors, lenders, and other creditors make about money. They're called capital providers for a reason. The information a mining company needs to provide to stakeholders to be useful may not be the same as the information a bank would provide, because the industries differ in significant ways. That's why IFRS allows a lot of freedom with regards to the format of the financial statements. Different industries need to show different things to be useful to their stakeholders, their decision makers. Having said that, IFRS does not allow total freedom. To ensure a minimum level of information for all businesses, IFRS has some basic presentation requirements. Let's go through the listing of basic items that need to be presented on the Statement of Income, Comprehensive Income, under IFRS. There are nine required line items. First is revenues. Second, costs incurred for financing the business. Third, profit or loss from associates or joint ventures accounted for using the equity method. Fourth, income tax expense or refund from continuing operations. Fifth, discontinued operations net of income taxes. Sixth, profit or loss, also called net income or net loss. Seven, earnings per share for continuing and discontinuing operations. Eight, other comprehensive income with details. Nine, comprehensive income. Now that we've listed all of the items, let's look at each in detail so you get a better idea of what each of these line items requires. First, revenues are likely the most important number on the income statement because it is the key to a business's performance, which is what the income statement measures. It must be grouped by type. For example, income from selling products must be separated from interest income and income from investments. Each category of revenue, if it's material, must be reported separately, either on the face of the statement or in the notes. What does that mean? On the face of the financial statement means it is placed on the actual financial statement, broken down line by line item and providing a total. However, in some cases it is impossible to provide all the details in the statements since it's just too detailed. That problem is solved by providing a condensed statement and then providing supplementary schedules in the notes to the financial statements. These schedules in the notes support the total on the face of the financial statement. This can reduce the statement to just a few lines on a single page. Anyone wishing to know the details must pay attention to the supporting schedules which are located in the notes. Revenues, categorized by type. The second line item is financing costs and they must be reported separately. What did it cost the company to finance their growth and expansion and their day-to-day -day operations? The cost of financing may seriously affect the business's performance, and it will absolutely affect the assessment of how risky the business is. This is with regards to providing the business with additional capital, such as a loan, at some point in the future. Because it is so important, it must be included as a separate line item on the face of the statement. Third is the profit or loss from investments, which are accounted for using the equity method. What are we talking about here? Let's break it down for a moment. Earnings are lost from what investments? From either joint ventures or associates. What are they? For a joint venture, we're talking about a joint arrangement as defined under IFRS 11. A joint arrangement is where two or more entities agree to partner together for a specific reason, like an activity, and they sign a contract which states how the partnering will work. The arrangement usually has a limited life and a carefully defined set of activities or objectives. An example would be two mining companies who have a joint arrangement to explore a specific geographical area in Canada. 
Once that exploration is finished, so is the joint arrangement. Key to a joint arrangement is that the parties have joint control, meaning that any strategic decisions must be agreed to by all the parties, a unanimous consent. In a joint venture, the investor, the entity who makes the investment, has a right to the net assets of the joint venture. The other type of investment is an associate. This is where the investor owns over 20% of the shares of an other entity. The 20% is a rule of thumb, meaning that if the ownership share is 20% or greater, we assume they're an associate, but really we would have to look at the facts before we make this decision. If that 20% rule applies, then the investor is assumed to have significant influence. This means they have the power to involve themselves in the operations of the entity they are invested in. This is often demonstrated by things such as being able to vote in a member of the board of directors, or having one of your senior managers work in the investee company. Both of these things would indicate that the investor has significant influence and the investment is therefore categorized as an associate. If that is the case, then the associate must use the equity method to account for their investment. What does this mean? Well, on the balance sheet, it means that the investor will report their share, say 28%, of the net assets of the investee's business. It would be a one line item under assets that must be fully described in the notes to the financial statements. On the income statement, it would mean that the investor's share of the investee's profit or loss is reported as one line item on the income statement with the full details described in the notes to the financial statements. To summarize, profit or loss from the investments accounted for under the equity method is the income or loss from a joint venture or associate which is reported on one line in the income statement but detailed in the notes. Why is this required? Because unlike normal revenues and expenses from continuing operations, these investments are only partially under the control of management and therefore an important factor for shareholders to know so that they can appropriately assess the profitability of the business. Four is income tax, also a required line item. This is either the income tax expense because the company has revenues greater than expenses or an income tax refund because the company has expenses that are greater than their revenues. Income tax expense reduces the profit and is recorded as a debit. However, income tax refunds are recorded as credits, meaning that they reduce expenses and technically are similar to revenue since revenues are recorded as credits. Let's do an example just to clarify this concept. If there is income before taxes of $10,000, then there is income tax expense of $2,000 if the company has a 20% marginal tax rate. Profit would then be $8,000. But if there were losses before income tax of $6,000, then the company would get a tax refund of $1,200. This would reduce the amount of the loss, so in this case, the $1,200 refund would reduce the $6,000 loss before taxes to only $4,800 loss after taxes. Income taxes must be disclosed for both continuing operations as well as discontinued operations. Why? Because it is only partially under the control of management and therefore an important factor for stakeholders to know so they can appropriately assess the profitability of the business. Line item five is discontinued operations. We're not going to say much about this now because there'll be a separate video about discontinued operations, but just so you know the basics, this is when the business sells a major line segment or geographical area and they sell it as a whole unit. This line item must include both the losses from the write down of the assets and liabilities being sold, net of income tax refunds, and the profit or loss from operating this part of the business before it was discontinued, net of income taxes that are applicable, either an expense if there's a profit or a refund if there's a loss. Why are discontinued operations reported as a separate line item? Because the information has no predictive value. This line of business will not continue into the future. For this reason, it must be listed as a separate line item on the statement. Item six is profit or loss from the total operations. 
which are all the lines we have already covered, and expenses. What? You didn't catch this? To see this, let's go back to our listing of line items. Notice, in our listing there is no line item for expenses, such as the cost of goods sold, depreciation expense, utilities expense, etc. We have financing costs and income taxes, but nothing else. However, since we have to have a line item called profit or loss from total operation, there must be a line item for expenses on the statement. It's just not a required line item officially. Line item 6 is therefore a total of all the prior line items and expenses, which must also be deducted. Item 7 is earnings per share. We'll have a separate video on how to calculate earnings per share, but on the face of the statements, there must be the following basic earnings per share from continuing operations and for discontinued operations, plus a total earnings per share for both operations together. In addition, on the face of the statement, there must be diluted earnings per share from continuing operations and diluted earnings per share from discontinued operations and then diluted earnings per share from both operations together. We'll discuss earnings per share in a future video because earnings per share is considered a very important ratio with regards to assessing a business's performance. Next is other comprehensive income. This area is so complex that I defer coverage to a different video, but we can say right now that other comprehensive income are the gains and losses due to changes in equity that are not part of the normal operations of the business. These non-operating items can be used to assess the riskiness of future earnings, meaning they have predictive value, which is why they are now included on the statement of income, comprehensive income. These are gains or losses which are unrealized and are due to a number of items, such as the revaluing of investments or foreign exchange differences. We will cover more about other comprehensive income in a future video. Line 9 is simply the total of all the prior line items and expenses, which must be deducted to get the total, but not including earnings per share, since this is a ratio and not something that needs to be included in the calculation. So, are we done? Mm, not quite. Notice at the top of my page was the words statement of income slash comprehensive income. That's because businesses have a choice to do one statement called the statement of comprehensive income, or they can choose to do two statements, one called the statement of income or income statement, which is immediately followed by the statement of comprehensive income, not the same as the statement of comprehensive income when we have one statement. <sighs> Let's see how the line items work under both scenarios. I think that'll clarify everything. If a business chooses one statement, it will be called the statement of comprehensive income. The order of the items will be as follows. Notice something? Line 7, earnings per share, has been moved down to the bottom of the statement. That's right. If a business chooses to use one statement format, they will call it the statement of comprehensive income and the earnings per share would be moved down to below the comprehensive income line. Be sure to note this if you decide to complete a statement of comprehensive income, all in one statement. If a business decides to go with a two statement option instead, they must produce a statement of income also called the income statement, and then placed immediately after this, there must be a statement of comprehensive income, which is different than the other statement of comprehensive income we just talked about. So what's included in each of these statements? The income statement includes line items 1 to 7, with earnings per share at the bottom of the statement. Notice that no information about comprehensive income is permitted on this statement. Next, the business must create a statement of comprehensive income, which must start with the required line item number six, profit or loss from the overall business. This is the same profit or loss from the total operations that's at the bottom of the income statement, exactly the same number. The statement then lists the other comprehensive income and total comprehensive income, which is profit or loss from the operations plus other comprehensive income gains less other comprehensive income losses. Notice the line item seven is missing. That's because the earnings per share is already on the income statement. This version of the statement of comprehensive income is a very short statement. The choice of whether to do one statement or two statements is the businesses. Either one statement called the statement of comprehensive income or two statements called the statement of income, also income statement, 
and the statement of comprehensive income, which is, of course, not the same statement as when we only produce one statement of comprehensive income, even though the name is the same. Damn that IFRS. Now it's the end. Thank you so much for watching my video. Hopefully you found it helpful. In my next video, I'll be introducing the concept of other comprehensive income. Tum, tum.